was the third time we'd matched. She messaged first. I was drunk enough to send a message, but not enough to make me creative or funny. She replied, though. It's been about five months now. I wish I could just enjoy it. And I do, I think. When I'm with her, I do just enjoy it. But when we're not together and I'm alone, I just start obsessing over next year, whether we'll be together, what we'll be doing. Oh, I can't even picture next year. Um, I got an offer for this Sculpture Masters, the one I've always wanted, and I think I'm probably going to turn it down. Um, when I got the offer, I just thought, you bitch, you selfish bitch. Sculpture, really, now. I get stuck in this mental whirlpool of trying to focus on the immediate future and not being able to think about the immediate future without thinking about the long-term future and not being able to think about the long-term future because we don't have one. We don't, like... Everything I do right now feels selfish. Every morning, I read another article telling me that we have 20 years left. 12, 10. It's these five years or the world will fall apart. Making art is selfish and being vegan is selfish. And saying I'm never going to fly again would be downright narcissistic because it's probably just to make people think that I'm a better person. I mean, it already is falling apart in some places, but... People here read that on the news and think, oh, it must be normal. It must be normal for countries like that to have tsunamis and 30 degree heat one day followed by minus 20 the next and floods that displace your entire home, family, life. In my application, I whinged on about my environmentally conscious practice and how it's all about grassroots shit. And if we set a new precedent, everyone will follow. I know I have to do something but I don't know what. I've always known what I wanted to do after college and now that I don't, it's almost embarrassing. I only use recycled materials and I did this whole installation where I repurposed the sculptures I'd made. It's this never ending journey of reduce, reuse, recycle. It's really powerful and it's gonna make people think. I don't have a superiority complex. I'm pretty sure I have a superiority complex. I'm just not used to seeing nothing in front of me. We've all entertained the notion that our art can change the world, but I think part of being an artist is reaching that point where you're like, that's bullshit. I'm doing this because I like it. I think I'm clinging on to Theo. Clinging on to her because she's there and she's great. And I just want something I can hold on to. I know also that wanting to be with someone away from the world and away from all that, I know that that's selfish. Everyone keeps telling me that I should trust my gut, that only I know how I feel, that I would know if I was using her, taking advantage of her. I think I'm going to turn down the masters. Seriously? I feel like I should be doing something more meaningful with my life. I have no idea what that is, though. Do you want to come over? Yeah. You can stay with me for a while, if you want. Yeah. I'd like that. All those tiny plays that are so uh, powerful. You're all very welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And um, we have two remaining sessions for you this afternoon. Um, as you see in this session, we'll be looking at delivering the clean energy transformation. Um, and just to say, I'm going to shortly introduce uh, our panel of speakers, but to continue um, using Slido for your questions. If anyone does want to uh, submit a handwritten one, I don't know if anyone has done that yet, but there's plenty of colleagues about the room um, who can do that. Um, as you can see, there are three speakers joining me on stage, and I will introduce them shortly. But our first uh, speaker is joining us uh, from Washington, 
DC today, and we're delighted to welcome Dr. Varun Sabaram to the Accelerate Conference. He's a physicist, best-selling author, and clean energy technology expert with experience spanning the corporate, public, and academic um, sectors. He is currently serves in the Biden-Harris administration as the Senior Director for Clean Energy Innovation and Competitiveness for Secretary John Kerry, who we know is the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. To tell us a little bit more about the American framework for a clean energy future, let's hand over the virtual floor to Varun. Thank you so much. Um, and congratulations to the IIEA on this extraordinary conference. I am just so uh, distressed that I could not make the journey over to Dublin. Um, but I do want to take this moment to congratulate Ireland on everything that it's done at roughly 50% of its electricity from renewables. Ireland is a beacon for the rest of the world, including my own country, on how to get to a high penetration renewable future. Um, particularly want to salute the work of Minister Eamon Ryan, a friend who I've gotten to see in many uh, events over the last couple of years uh, as our paths have crossed. Today, let me just say up front, uh, we speak against the backdrop of the latest just horrific attacks on Ukraine in Russia's unprovoked and unjustified war underscores, yet again, the importance of standing with our European allies on energy issues and swiftly transitioning to net zero to bolster Europe's energy security. And the United States and President Biden's administration have put climate and energy security right up front on the agenda. Uh, I, I work for Secretary John Kerry, who is the first ever U.S. official solely dedicated to climate as the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy who also has a, a seat on the National Security Council. Um, and President Biden, when he took office in 2021, on day one, rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement and didn't stop there. Within three months, President Biden announced that the United States would raise our own ambition, if, you know, after long last, and uh, increase our nationally determined contribution, NDC, to a 50%, 50 to 52% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide in 2030. We went to Glasgow with Secretary Kerry leading our delegation with 65% of the world by GDP raising their NDCs in line with a net zero by 2050 future. And this year, as we go to Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt for COP27, we know it's the implementation COP, the one where we meet our pledges and bring along the rest of the world that hasn't yet raised their ambition commensurately. But here in the United States, and that's what I wanna to talk to you about today, we have taken those steps to begin implementing our pledge. How do we reach our NDC of 50%? Well, it started last year with the bipartisan infrastructure law that President Biden signed into law, tens of billions of dollars to invest in emerging clean technologies like hydrogen hubs around the United States. And it continued this year with a absolutely historic piece of legislation. This year, we passed in August the Inflation Reduction Act. I'll say, we're, we're speaking in Dublin, it has unfortunately got the acronym the IRA. Uh, but but the, the Inflation Reduction Act is our climate bill. It has uh, an extraordinary set of investments across the economy that when paired with the last year's bipartisan infrastructure law and a range of executive actions and subnational action, cities and states, it's going to get us to the United States 50 to 52% target reduction. How's it gonna do it? Well, between now and 2030, the principal ways that the US will reduce our emissions are first in the power sector, where clean energy from wind and solar, backed up by batteries, uh, transmitted through long transmission lines, all of this is going to reduce our emissions sharply in the power sector. And in the transportation sector, um, thanks to the IRA, we're going to have incentives that bring electric vehicles as a share of new car sales to more than 50% in this country. It's accelerated, it's like the name of this conference, it's really accelerated the progress of our clean energy transition in this decade. So that energy transition is well underway in power and passenger transportation. But I think the IRA could be even more important, not just the United States, but even globally, for the harder to abate sectors, those long distance transportation sectors like aviation and shipping, those heavy industries like steel, cement, concrete, aluminum. In these sectors, the energy transition simply hasn't started yet and it's going to need to accelerate. Now, the United States will account for 
between now and 2100, less than 5% of global emissions, more than 95% will be from outside of our borders. And so it's that much more important that anything we do has to have spillover effects. The IRA gives the incentives, the technology incentives to drive down the costs of these emerging technologies, not just in the United States, but all over the world to boost the clean energy transition in Ireland or in India or in Indonesia. I'll also say that innovation is so important. And, and today my, my talk is called Energizing America uh, after a book I wrote right before joining, which asked the US to triple its investment in research, development, and demonstration. And we are on our way, I'm proud to say. But it's countries around the world joining with us. President Biden announced a $90 billion challenge in June for the world to unite and invest $90 billion in demonstrating emerging innovative technologies. And I'm proud to say that just two weeks ago in Pittsburgh, the US hosted the Global Clean Energy Forum and 16 countries joined us to pledge $94 billion and shatter that target in just two months of diplomacy. What I'd like to do now is just show some slides, if the technology team wouldn't mind putting up the slides. I, I'd love to show some slides quickly about how the United States not only is investing in these technologies at home, but we're catalyzing the demand for these technologies through President Biden's signature public-private partnership, the First Movers Coalition. Together with the IRA, we're going to support the supply of and the demand for new technologies. As you can see here, the First Movers Coalition creates early market demand for these critical technologies in these hard to abate sectors. It was launched by President Biden at COP26 and earlier this year at Davos with Bill Gates, Secretary Kerry and other CEOs broadened the coalition. Next slide, please. The coalition covers uh, eight different hard to abate sectors. They represent more than 30% of today's carbon emissions, but a majority by 2050 if we don't act quickly enough. These sectors that we've already launched, you see on the left-hand side, aviation steel, shipping trucking, and then aluminum and carbon dioxide removal. At Sharm El Sheikh, we'll launch a concrete sector, and next year we'll launch the chemical sector. Next slide. Overall, nearly 60 companies, I think we're actually at 60 as of this morning, 60 companies have joined us. They represent more than 10% of the global Fortune 2000 market cap. These are the biggest companies in the world. Nine governments have joined us uh, that represent 50% of global GDP. And you see the companies and what commitments they've made on the right-hand side. And I'll walk through some of these commitments uh, in just a moment. Next slide, please. Here's an example. In the steel sector, what a first mover company like Ford Motor that signed up for this coalition is doing is they've committed to buy 10% of their steel in 2030 from near zero carbon sources. Think about it. There is no near zero carbon steel supply except for one plant in Sweden today. But by 2050 on the left-hand side, you can see that we have to use these emerging nascent technologies to get to 100% green steel. The only way to do that is to create an early market incentive. Now, we did this with life-saving vaccines. We promised to buy a certain quantity of life-saving vaccines, and Moderna and Pfizer brought them to market. We promised to pay for companies that would bring commercial space flight to the market, and SpaceX did so. In clean energy, we can do the exact same thing. Ford Motor, therefore, is bringing this technology to market. Next slide. Now, the reason that this is possible is because in the United States, as well as in Europe, incentives will drive down the cost of building these facilities. Before the IRA, there was a green premium, uh, premium cost of building a green steel plant versus a non-green steel plant of more than $100 a ton. Now, with the IRA, we're able to, depending on which technology you use, whether it's carbon capture on the left-hand side or green hydrogen on the right-hand side, oh, let's go back slide. You are able to get clean steel for nearly or exactly the same price as dirty steel. And that is game changing. Next slide. In aviation, companies like United and Delta and Apple have all said, we will use a small part of our supply chain, 5% of our jet fuel, and replace it with clean fuels that reduce emissions by 85% or more. That's not even today's SAFs. That's the next generation of sustainable aviation fuels. Those that, for example, are powered to liquids that use clean hydrogen and captured carbon dioxide. Next slide, please. And Thanks to the IRA, we have costs of these new technologies in 2030 
that could quickly approach the cost of jet fuel today. Next slide, please. For shipping, fuels like ammonia, green ammonia produced using green hydrogen, could become nearly free by 2030 thanks to these incentives for producing hydrogen or for, carbon, uh, for capturing carbon uh, through the 45Q incentive. Next, next slide, please. For direct air capture, the cost could be less than $100 a ton in 2030. That's or an order of magnitude below where it sits today to sequester carbon permanently from the atmosphere for thousands of years. Next slide, please. And finally, near zero carbon cement could go to free or even negative cost by 2030, thanks to these incentives. So as a result of all of these incentives and of the demand that we've created through the First Movers Coalition, we have a chance in the United States to reduce the cost of clean technologies that are not yet on the market today. And by bringing these innovative technologies to the market, we lower their costs and speed the net zero transitions in countries around the world so that the United States is not just hitting our own less than 5% of future cumulative global emissions, we are affecting the 95 plus percent of future global cumulative emissions all over the world. Uh, can we come off the slide deck, please? I'll just close by saying, um, today is an exciting day. I'm, I'm so excited to hear the other panelists and to hear your questions. Um, critically, uh, there is no time to wait. It is equally important that in this decade, we spend the time reducing our emissions through the technologies we already have, whether it's solar and wind and batteries and electric vehicles, and that we spend this decade investing in the technologies that we need, whether it's clean hydrogen, carbon capture, long duration storage, advanced nuclear, and on and on. You do those two things in tandem and you will see immediate gains this decade from the technologies we have, and you will see the 2030s and 2040s witness a historic scale up to reduce the costs of providing some of the pillars of the global economy from ammonia to steel to cement to plastics. That's what we will need to decarbonize the whole economy. You can't do one without the other. And I'm delighted that the United States is playing this leadership role along with our partners like Ireland and our other allies in Europe and countries all over the world. Thanks so much. And I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Varun, uh, particularly because I know it's a much earlier start for you in uh, DC, and you're right, it's not too many uh, conversations in public in Ireland where you hear it uh, peppered with the phrase, thanks to the IRA, but we appreciate um, the, it was amazing just to see uh, the uh, transformative power of that act. So let's bring it um, back to uh, domestic level now. Our next speaker is going to question uh, delivering the change needed to meet the net zero target by reflecting on Ireland's 2030 and 2050 targets. Dr Paul Dean is a research fellow in clean energy futures at the Environmental Research Institute's Mare Centre in UCC. He's authored and co-authored over 120 technical papers on the future of energy. He is, uh, our, he is a first author on Ireland's low carbon roadmap in 2015. Um, he's an active contributor also, not just to domestic, but European policy thinking on clean energy. And in 2019, was the Royal Irish Academy speaker in computer science and engineering. So without further ado, we'll give the floor over to you. Wonderful introduction. You'd never guess that I actually wrote that myself. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Look, climate action is fundamentally about reducing emissions. You know, it's, we, we talk a lot about EVs, we talk a lot about heat pumps, hydrogen, offshore wind, etc. That's all necessary. But essentially, they're proxies for climate action. You know, it's really about reducing emissions. And really, what my presentation is about this afternoon is a stock take on how are we doing in climate action in Ireland. It's fundamentally important that we have these sense checks. When I talk about climate action in a public domain, you typically get, you know, three responses. You know, typically in a, in a more public domain, you get the, I suppose, the, the, the typical response that, ah, sure, the climate has always changed. And yes, that's true, and it, but it has changed over geological time periods. And now it's changing over generational time periods. That's worrying, it's different, and there's a need for action. You hear the typical refrain as well, just heard on the radio recently, ah, sure, Ireland is small, our emissions are tiny, we don't really matter. Yeah, look. We're 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That's a coincidence of geography. We're a small island, we're a small population. If we look at the consequences of our actions, of our, the way we live, the way we consume, the way we use energy, the way we produce energy, the way we farm, then Ireland, as a citizen, we're one of the largest polluters of greenhouse gases on a per-person basis in Europe. That's not a really good record to have. 
And then you hear about, look, we're doing well. You know, Ireland is doing very well. We're producing 40% of our electricity. We're a world leader. But we confuse electricity with energy. We are one of the most fossil fuel reliant countries in Europe. Today, we're spending 1 million euros every hour importing oil and gas into our country. For a country that's so rich in ideas and renewable resources, both onshore and offshore, our ability to grow energy, our ability to save energy, we're not in a healthy space. So I'm going to do a sense check and a stock take of where we are in terms of our climate action. There is a tendency sometimes, and it's necessary, and I get it, to get swept up in a wave of optimism for the future. We talk about 2050, 30 years away. That's very necessary, that's very compelling, but a lot of our challenges are actually today, the next three to four years. Ireland has set, quite correctly, science-based targets for climate action, uh, based on the fact that it's not the emissions for some point in time that matter, in 2050 or 2040, it's the cumulative buildup of emissions, the pollution from the cumulative buildup of emissions, it's, it's that is what's harming our planet. It's a little bit like smoking. If you go into your doctor and say, hey, look, I'm gonna, if I smoke, I'm gonna quit smoking in 30 years time, that's great. It's the cumulative buildup of that smoking that's damaging your lungs. It's the cumulative buildup of emissions from our society, from our families, from our communities, right across Ireland, right across the world, that's driving climate change. And quite correctly, and thankfully, the Irish government, a number of years ago, set science-based targets based on cumulative emissions impacts. So it's important that we don't get too swept up in the optimism for the future, which is necessary. The cumulative buildup of emissions requires us to think about now. It requires us to act early. And it requires us to not address the problems in the future, but address the problems that we have in the present. And as we see from my short presentation, that there's some real big challenges um, uh, fundamentally uh, facing Ireland. So the title of my presentation, as I stare down to here now, is actually completely wrong. It's actually, uh, it's actually talking for about the year 2025. And that's because that is the first legislative period that we will have in Ireland's carbon budgets. So a couple of weeks ago, the Irish government announced legally binding cumulative carbon budgets based on carbon ceilings. And the check-in time for that is in December 2025. So when we think about climate action, we often think, well, we can delay our problems you know, to the future, 2040, 2050, December 2025, we'll be the first call for reckoning, and we will see how Ireland is doing. And with my friends down in UCC, you see Professor Brian O'Gallery here, Professor Hannah Daly in UCC, Karen O'Callaghan, Amy Holland. We did a small sense check on where emissions are going at the moment. I've only one slide, but it packs a punch. Um, the climate legislation that we have in Ireland states that the cumulative emissions are important. It's that what really matters. And I want to draw your attention, first of all, to the big circle on the right-hand side. Our legislation states that we can only emit as a society, as communities, as families, a maximum of 295 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent between January 2021 and December 2025. 60-month period, OK? With my colleagues in UCC, we've checked in. We're 18 months into that first legislative period, and as the top of the graph says, we're about 30% into the time frame, and we've already burned through about 36% of our carbon budget. So we're less than a third of the way there, and we've burned through over a third of the budget already. That's worrying, because we're only 18 months into this target already, and we're already off track. Our emissions need to be reducing. Uh, they're increasing across most sectors. And it's the cumulative buildup of emissions that the legislation requires us to keep an eye on because it correctly reflects the, the science. So again, if we look at that, that big pie chart on your, uh, your right-hand side, overall, across farming, across forestry, across land use, across electricity generation, across heating, we have emitted over just over 101 million tons at the end of August last year. Okay, so this is up to date. That means that we have a, let me just check my figures here, that means that we've got another 187 million tons that we can go. So we're already off track. Let me talk to you a little bit about the numbers that we're less certain about here, first of all. We're less certain about the numbers for agriculture. We're less certain about the numbers for land use, land use change and forestry. That's because those emissions are difficult to track. Data doesn't become available from different preliminary sources or different proxy sources at an early stage. For, for those sectors, what we've done is that we've looked at the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, with additional measures, and we've taken proxy reductions of their, or prorated their reductions in emissions out to uh, the, the end of August uh, last month. But even looking at the preliminary data, it's quite clear that we are still off track for agriculture, and that we're still off track for land use, land use change and forestry. 
In agriculture, we do need to provide different avenues for earning revenues for farmers. We do need less, li less livestock in Ireland. We don't need less farmers. We need to give people viable options to use their land, produce different, uh, different ways of using their land, different ways to earn an income, and we need to do that quickly. Agriculture is our major source that we've heard already. The size of these bubbles, by the way, reflects, I suppose, the, the, the size of the carbon budget that's available to each individual industry. If we look at electricity, and look, electricity is our good news story, wasn't it? You know, we tell the world we're doing really well on offshore, uh, um, uh, on, we tell the world we're, we're doing really well on onshore wind, and we have. Over just under 40% of our electricity last year came from renewables, mainly onshore wind. That's really good. But in terms of emissions reduction, we're not on track. The power sector can emit between January 2021 and December 2025 just 40 million tonnes worth of emissions. In 2021, we emitted 10 million tonnes. Up until August, just last month, we emitted uh, 7.5 million tonnes. We're on track to emit about 11.5 million tonnes this year for the power sector. Our emissions are going in the wrong direction. It's not the renewable component, it's the non-renewable component. We need to move away from the most polluting forms of fossil fuel, particularly coal and particularly oil. That's what's driving up our emissions in the power sector in Ireland. That's what ultimately is pushing those emissions in the wrong direction. But there's a tension there between reducing our emissions and keeping the light on. We're not burning coal just for the fun. We have a power system that's physically strained in Ireland at the moment, and we need those power plants, we need those oil-fired generation to come in in times of system stress. We've failed to build adequate gas-fired generation in Ireland, and that's what we need to do, and we need to do it quickly. And people often say, well, why do you need to build fossil fuel generation in Ireland when you need to be moving away from it? Renewables reduce the use of fossil fuel power plant. They do not replace the need. We have failed to meet that need in Ireland. Our analysis in UCC has shown that by building fossil fuel gas-fired plant in Ireland, it will reduce our emissions, increase our security supply, and make it easier to meet our emissions reduction target. We need to move away from coal, we need to move away from oil, because it's driving up our emissions within the power sector. And in parallel, we can't drop the ball on onshore and offshore wind. We need to do all these things in parallel, otherwise our emissions uh, will increase. So it's not just about renewable targets anymore for the power sector. It's about cumulative emissions, and the early stages, the preliminary data are showing that we're already off track for the power sector in Ireland, and that's worrying. The other sector, let's look at in a bit more detail, is transport. Transport, I suppose, got a bit of a lucky break in 2021 in terms of COVID. But there was a drop in emissions because, because of the lockdowns, because of the COVID prevention, uh, prevention measures, and that allowed emissions to reduce. But preliminary data just up to August last month has shows that those emissions have rebounded with a vengeance. Diesel sales are up 18% year to date on, on, on last year's sales. Same with petrol, 13%. So emissions are bouncing back. And transport isn't just about EVs, which we tend to focus a lot on, and that's necessary and it's correct, but it's a tiny part of the solution. We need to think about active ways of moving people around. Cycling, bus lanes, uh, infrastructure, remote working, uh, um, uh, all these elements will really need to provide a different cocktail of mixtures to reduce our emissions in transport. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very hard to meet our overall emissions reductions. In the residential sector and in the, and in the commercial sectors, the story is equally not as good. We will probably see a small reduction in residential emissions this year, not so much because of policy, but because of prices. Again, we are one of the most fossil fuel reliant countries in Europe. The cost of that reliance on fossil fuels is the price that we're paying, the high price of energy that we pay. Home heating oil, kerosene, fuel oil will increase this year. What tends to happen when we look back at the past, when prices go up, these things tend to be quite elastic and emissions go down. It's not because of climate policy, it's because of geopolitics that our emissions will reduce in the residential sector. And we heard uh, earlier about the hardship that that, uh, uh, that, the hardship that, will, that, 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 that will endure. So the emissions sector, I suppose in many regards, the overall emission story is not very compelling. In a word, we're, we are not on target to meet our first legislative um, uh, carbon budget in 2025, and there will be political repercussions for that. Uh, and, and also a wider reputational impact. Remember, we tell the world we're clean, we're, we're, clean, we're green, and we care about this stuff, but the numbers tell a different story. The numbers tell a very different narrative. 
A couple of years ago, we did a piece of small piece of work for the Wind Energy Association of Ireland looking at net zero story futures to 2050. And all the stuff that we spoke about today we're going to need. You know, we need EVs, we need hydrogen. But fundamentally, the most important thing that we need across society is a policy mindset that puts net zero at the core of everything, at the core of decisions making at a political level, at a county level, at a community level. All our institutions, from the air grids to the CRUs, need to put net zero at the core of all our energy, uh, of all our energy decisions. Part of the research that we did for Wind Energy Ireland it looked at what we call the no regret or low regret options. There's things that we know we need to do in Ireland. We don't have to have long meandering conversations. There's things that we know that are robust, that are resilient, and that will provide win-win uh, outcomes, if you will. And they are saving energy through energy efficiency, electrification by essentially putting more plugs on things. Remember, 80% of the energy use in Ireland is not electricity. 80% of the things in our lives, in our communities, in our society, doesn't have plugs on, the, on things. We need to increase the acceleration of electrification. And finally, we need to play to our greatest strength. It's our renewable resources. We're not a country who's rich in fossil fuels. We're not a country who's rich like, 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 like other countries in terms of hydro. We have wind. We have great ability to produce energy. We have great ability to save energy. That's our greatest strength. We need to play to that strength in Ireland but also be honest and acknowledge our weaknesses. We're way behind target. And of all the options that are available to us as a society and our government in terms of climate change, waiting isn't one of those. So finally, just to finish off, I suppose, in terms of our emissions, we are not on track for our uh, emissions reduction goals in Ireland. And I suppose maybe drawing, Alex, on the, the title of, the, of, the, of, the, conference, of the, the conference that we have today, we need to accelerate to a level that we have never done before. And in credit to the Irish government, we are doing a lot of the things correctly. We're providing very generous grant across transport, across heating, but we need to bring those to a level that we've never seen before, at a pace that we've never done before, and we have to achieve emissions reductions that we have never, ever delivered before. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, so, so much of today's conversations have been about how we just get to that unprecedented level and um, that everything needs to be done. Uh, one bit that might maybe help out is um, hydrogen because the role of green hydrogen is um, expected to play a hugely important uh, role in the transition. Um, and last year, ESB had its uh, launch its own Green Atlantic initiative to repurpose a former coal-fired station um, to, into a green energy hub where lots of different uh, technologies, including green hydrogen, are going to be deployed to uh, with a capacity to power uh, over one and a half, 1.6 million homes in Ireland. Um, also last year, the UK um, doubled uh, the UK's hydrogen production ambition um, up to 10 GW, I think, by uh, 2030. So how is that panning out um, in the midst of their fuel crisis also? Well, we're delighted to have Claire Jackson with us today, the Chief Executive Officer of Hydrogen UK and one of the leading uh, voices in hydrogen in the UK and elsewhere. So you're very, very welcome. I'll hand over to you, Claire. Well, hopefully I should be able to answer some of those questions, if perhaps not all of those questions. Um, but yeah, it is absolutely fantastic to be here this afternoon. Thank you so much to the um, IIEA, um, a lot of vowels there, um, for the invitation. Um, so yeah, my name is Claire. I've been working with the energy industry on hydrogen for about the last seven years. I like to tell people that I was working in hydrogen before it was cool. Um, I'm thinking about having a t-shirt with that made up on. Um, it's very fashionable these days to be working in the hydrogen sector. Um, but yeah, so it is um, a really, really exciting topic. It's never been a more exciting time to be a part of um, working with hydrogen. So what I'm going to sort of talk to you about today is I'm first going to talk to you about why everyone is so excited about hydrogen. Um, and then I'm going to take you a little bit through sort of where we are globally at the moment. There's been a lot of, you know, keeping up with what's going on in hydrogen is a full-time job. Um, the poor chap in my team that has that as his full-time job, I will be paying for his therapy for the next 10 years. It's so difficult. Um, and then I'll take you through a little bit about what we've been doing in the UK and where we're sort of up to now. Um, but just before I do that, a little bit about Hygiene UK. Um, we are the industry association um, that looks after all the sort of companies that are really excited about the role that Hygiene can play and are committed um, to seeing that through and uh, making Hygiene actually a reality rather than something that we just talk about. Um, I'm wondering whether this, does this change the slides? 
the big green button. I'm, I'm terrible at technology, apart from hydrogen. <laughs> um, perhaps someone else could move the next slide on, <laughs> given that I'm in... The top one, oh, sorry, I'm pushing the bottom one, there you go. So these are our wonderful members. Um, as I said, we work sort of across the value chain, um, right from the guys that are deploying renewables and interested in um, how you produce hydrogen, through to the guys that are interested in moving it around, um, right through to people who are developing end-use technologies. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to start off um, by talking about why everyone is very, very interested in hygiene in the UK. And I would say I'm going to broadly sort of pull this down into four different categories. Um, the first is because we cannot deliver net zero without it. Um, there are huge chunks of our energy system which you just can't electrify. Um, and I think sometimes we end up in this sort of false argument about electrification or hydrogen. Um, and the reality is that we need them both. They go together like Bert and Ernie, like... Ireland and the UK, um, you know, they're best friends and actually they support and love each other. Um, we need to be doing all of these various different low carbon um, sort of solutions as quickly as is humanly possible. Um, but there are certain areas that we need hydrogen for. So these are things like heavy industry when we're making cement, steel, um, auto manufacturing, um, heavy duty vehicles, so aviation, maritime, um, those sort of big trucks that you can't put a big battery in without losing half the payload at the back end. Um, and also in the UK in particular, um, domestic heat is another area where hydrogen um, can play a role. So we need it for net zero. Um, the second reason is to do with energy security. Um, now, unless you've been living under a rock for the last year, you've noticed that energy security is sort of coming up the list of priorities. Um, we need to deploy more domestic renewables as quickly as is humanly possible. But the challenge is you can't do that without hydrogen. So in the UK last year, um, we spent 1.5 billion on demand side and supply side matching in terms of our grid and on curtailment costs. So the more that you deploy renewables, the more challenging the economics become, unless you have a storage mechanism, and hygiene is that storage mechanism. Um, the third reason is to do with system resilience. Um, so in the UK, we move roughly about four times more energy through our pipes as we do through our pylons. Um, you know, only about 20% of our energy demand is actually currently met by um, electricity. Now, we know that we need to do more electrification. We know that we need to um, strengthen and, and, and reinforce that with that, those pylons, that electricity network. Um, but hydrogen can play a massive role. We have an 85% of our homes in the UK are connected to the gas grid. And if we can convert that gas grid to move around hydrogen rather than natural gas, and that reduces pressure on that already pressurized um, electricity um, transmission network. And the fourth reason is... Because hydrogen presents a really interesting economic opportunity. Hydrogen will be worth roughly 2.5 trillion US dollars by 2050. That is a lot of jobs. And those, those economies that move first and the leaders rather than followers um, will be the ones that get the sort of economic benefit from that. Um, so I'm going to talk you through a little bit about um, where we are globally at the moment. Um, so there has been a massive increase in hydrogen projects. We're currently at around 680 projects that represent 240 billion US dollars worth of investment. Um, you'll see that the large majority of that um, is still in Europe. Um, so we um, sort of have about 76 of those um, projects uh, um, from t up until 2030, that is, um, are in Europe. Um, but basically, most places around the world, most geographies have got hydrogen projects um, in the works. Um, and the really interesting thing is that year on year, even that 2030 target of where we're aiming for in terms of production projects is going up and up and up. Um, so we're now at 26.2 um, uh, megatons per annum capacity, cumulative capacity by 2030. And if you look at even just the last two years, you can see there the sort of 2020 line. Um, you know, we're looking at you know, two, two, three times more um, production capacity that will be online by 2030. Um, and the other interesting thing that you'll note there is the sort of split between um, what we sort of refer to in the hydrogen industry as green and blue. Um, so green being the electrolytic, um, sort of coupled with either renewables or nuclear, um, and the blue, which is using carbon capture and storage technologies. Um, so we have seeing a much more, um, a much greater proportion of that being green and renewable hydrogen um, than just low carbon hydrogen, which is interesting. Um, and the other thing that I think is also worth noting is that. Um, from the one part, we're now, seeing a, we're now reaching this point where projects are turning from ideas on paper to actually reality, real investment, real spades in the ground, real things that are operating. But we're still at a point where only 10% of that 240 billion worth of um, projects have actually reached FID. Um, and I would say that um, in Europe, it's probably even lower. And in the UK, 
Um, 99% of our production capacity has not yet reached um, FID. Um, so I want to sort of zoom in a little bit in terms of the UK. Now, we're very, very fortunate in the UK that we have, I personally think, some of the most exciting and world-leading projects um, that we have in our pipeline. And I just want to talk about sort of three of them very, very briefly um, now. So we've got um, Gigastack, um, which is a project um, that is in the sort of the Humber region. Um, for those of you not so good at geography, that's sort of the north northeast of, um, of the UK. Um, and this is looking at a 100 megawatt um, electrolyzer coupled with um, offshore wind from Ersted's offshore, offshore wind um, uh, farm. And it's going to be used initially in um, Philips 66 refinery to decarbonize um, that project there. And, and, it's, and it's very much to do with um, bringing down the cost of electrolyzers. Um, the UK has or had the very first um, giga, giga, giga factory for electrolyzers um, in sort of in Rotherham was ITMs. Um, and this project is all around getting the cost down, scaling up electrolyzer um, production. Um, then how could I not talk about HiNet when we've got ESB um, sponsoring this conference? Um, that's the project that ESB are in, involved with um, in the northwest region um, of the UK. And this is a sort of multi um, uh, sort of cluster approach. Um, so there's about 40 different um, organizations, industries that are looking to use the hydrogen there. And it's primarily a, um, a sort of low carbon hydrogen project. So there's a lot of CCUS involved there. Um, and it's, it's a whole end to end um, project where we've got a, a gas network going in there, hydrogen gas network, and the production and all of the end users. And then lastly, um, uh, Kebby Power, hydrogen power station, um, which will be um, the first 100% hydrogen power station um, anywhere in the world, um, which is a project between Equinor um, and SSC Thermal, which is a very exciting project. Um, and that is three that I've just picked out out of the myriad of different projects that we've got here. This was came from the, the UK government's hydrogen investment um, roadmap. Um, it's got 59 projects on it. We've just sort of updated this in the last month, and we've now got well over 100 projects um, that, are, that are going on across the UK. Um, so plenty, plenty to get involved in. Um, so one of the things that has stimulated this um, is the, the sort of world-leading policies. Now, um, this sort of kicked off um, last year uh, with the UK hydrogen strategy. Um, I hear that Ireland doesn't have a hydrogen strategy yet, so I think you should... Um, get one of those, um, they're great. Um, but it's all about providing that confidence to industry that the UK is the place to invest in hydrogen. Um, so we have um, a number of different sort of support schemes. Um, the, most, um, the most important one is the, the hydrogen business model. Um, this is a sort of similar CFD model to what was implemented um, to off for offshore wind, um, whereby that sort of government support in the early stages allowed the cost of offshore wind um, to come down on a very steep trajectory. And um, we are very confident that hydrogen will be able to go through that, um, that same uh, cost down. Um, as, as, as was sort of mentioned earlier, we had a five gigawatt target. Um, the energy security strategy increased that to 10 gigawatts. Um, we think that is sort of broadly, roughly in the right place now. Um, as an industry, we're not pushing for anything more. 10 gigawatts is quite enough to try and deliver um, in the remaining eight years that we have. Um, but yeah, and I, I, you know, I think we, we're in a very fortunate position in the UK. Um, don't ever let me, don't ever tell them that I said this, but the government's actually done a really good job when it comes to hydrogen. It's officially my job to keep them on their toes, so please don't tell them. I never would tell them, but they've done an absolutely fantastic job, and we're very pleased um, that we think that these policies will make the UK one of the best places in the world um, to deploy hydrogen solutions. Um, but there are still challenges um, that remain. Um, so long-term investor security um, is a huge challenge for these very, very big projects in these very nascent areas. Um, we have a certain amount of political volatility in the UK at the moment, um, which you may have noticed. Um, that's causing us some challenges. Um, we have a little bit of a slow legislative process um, that we're sort of pushing on. Um, the international competitiveness is a really interesting one as well. Um, as, as the sort of... Um, two speakers ago mentioned, um, the IRA has made the US a very, very interesting place um, to be investing in hydrogen. A lot of the companies that are developing hydrogen solutions are global international companies and they have to decide where it is that they want to invest. Um, and lastly, um, there is a massive challenge in terms of hydrogen is this entire energy system um, with production, infrastructure, and demand, and they've all got to come forward at the same time. Um, and that's a big challenge trying to pull that all together. Um, so this is my very, very last thing that I want to say. Um, these are the things that um, at Hygen UK we are working on to make sure um, that Hygen is ready for the next stage of its journey. 
Um, so making those hydrogen business models available to producers as, as quickly as we possibly can is very, very important. Um, we've done a lot of work in the UK around the production side of things, um, but we also need to be looking at how do we stimulate demand for hydrogen at the same time. Um, all of these various different end use sectors that hydrogen can play a part in are all distinctly different to each other, and we need that detailed thinking around end use policies. Um, Supply and demand need to be matched. We need the infrastructure. We need hydrogen storage. We need hydrogen networks. Um, those te tend to have really long lead times. Um, and the sort of modeling work that we've done, you sort of start to where you need to be by 2030, and you work backwards, and you realize you should have started these projects um, about five years ago. Um, we've got some big ambitions in the UK around what we want to do in hydrogen. Um, making sure that we have the skilled workforce to be able to deliver that is not an insubstantial challenge. Um, and lastly, hydrogen is going to touch every part of our energy system. It's going to touch every part of our society. And we need to bring people along on that journey with us. Um, and I think the last thing that I just want to leave you with, oh, no, this is our very detailed version, which you can um, find on our website around all the things, the many things that we need to do in terms of um, hydrogen. Um, the last thing I just want to leave you with is the sort of, um, I guess, the title of this conference, Accelerate. And when we look at what we have to deliver in the hydrogen sector, in the UK, depending on whose models you like to use, we roughly need to be able to build a hydrogen system that's roughly the size of our power domain today. That is an absolutely monumental challenge to deliver in 30 years. And so it's so important um, that we move fast, that we bring together um, all of the various different actors um, that need to play a part here and that we work together to achieve that. Um, but I feel very confident um, that um, working together, we'll be able to get there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Clara. I loved your upbeat assessment of the current state of UK-Irish relations. So maybe after you finish with hydrogen, we could get you to work on the protocol um, for us. But uh, thank you very, very much. It was a brilliant uh, presentation. Our last uh, speaker of the session um, is Harry Vamadavan, who's the Vice President of DNV and Director of UK and Ireland uh, Energy Systems at DNV. Um, he has, you took the lead, I think it was just last year, across all of DNV Energy Systems related uh, activities across renewables, power and ONG. And I think today he's going to look at some of those broader trends across the energy value chain and how they might impact the delivery of net zero. I think you might in particular, maybe even as it has happened a lot today, look at the energy security situation in Europe and uh, lots of other questions. So without further ado, hand me the floor is yours. And it's the big, it's the big green one. Good afternoon, and thank you for those kind words. Um, this is a lovely stage, so I'm going to go mobile. Um, so I've been in the energy industry now for over 30 years, and the trilemma when I started was reliability, affordability, sustainability. But I think you've heard from all of today's speakers, energy security, energy independence, and energy transition is the trilemma today. Um, many of us in the room are in the energy sector, and it's our day job. But I just want to give a quick shout out to the logo on my bottom left-hand side of the slide, or bottom right hand. Um, it's World Mental Health Day, and I think the session before lunch really highlighted the impact of the energy prices and the sleepless nights that are going to be happening due to the energy crisis. Um, energy transition. I think our speakers today have really highlighted it's not one transition. Yeah, there's an energy system we need to transition. There's a consumer transition. We absolutely have to take the consumers with us. There's a jobs transition. And then there's a whole host of mini transitions below that. So DMV has its fingers in many, many pies, from shipping to oil and gas to offshore wind, onshore wind, power grids, gas grids, uh, supply chains. And, ev and every year, we publish an energy transition outlook. We're owned by an independent Norwegian foundation, and we publish um, an energy outlook. And I'd like to just take you through some of the highlights of that. And the starting point is why the title of this uh, conference is Accelerate. Yeah? Um, the world is in trouble. And in reality, we talk about carbon budgets, but those carbon budgets are disappearing. Yeah? 1.5 degrees gone by the end of the decade. Two degrees gone by 2050, 2053, and we're well on the way to 2.3 degrees. The pandemic did give us a blip, yeah? but it also gave us peak oil. We don't believe um, oil production will ever be higher than 2019. 
Okay? So that gives an incredibly challenging backdrop. But there is an energy transition happening. Yeah? And on this slide, you'll see how electricity is going from 19% of today's um, energy system to 38%. And you've heard a lot about electrification. Yeah? And, but when you look at the energy system, today's energy system is 20% non-fossil, 80% fossil. Even by 2050, that picture has only changed to 55% non-fossil, 46% fossil fuels. And that's why we need to accelerate. But within this is an incredibly positive story of electrification, which Ireland has played a fantastic part, and so has the UK. And that's in terms of where has this electricity come from? Yeah? And 70% of this electricity has come from renewables. Yeah? And largely driven by onshore wind, solar, and offshore wind. And you see, actually, of that 70%, half is coming from fixed and floating um, offshore and onshore wind, and half is coming from solar PV. Okay. Now, we have to do so much more if we're going to accelerate. But it isn't that easy. And there are challenges, even in this forecast, to deliver a sevenfold increase in offshore wind. Yeah, Because that's what this is based on. But there are challenges in scaling up to meet our ambitions. You've heard quite a lot today about policy. Yeah, We need those goals and targets for gigawatts. Yeah, we need a transparent regulatory regime in which some of the pricing mechanisms and some of the taxes and some of the other discussion points are a little bit uncertain and not clearly defined. And then we absolutely need to speed up permitting and construction times. Yeah? When I spoke at COP26 on offshore wind, the average time it was taking us around the world was five to seven years to approve a wind farm. It'll be 2023 next year. It'll be 2030 when we bring those fields online. Clearly too late. A supply chain, yeah? And a supply chain that's already creaking today. If you talk to a lot of the developers, we're struggling with today's supply chain, let alone the one that is going to deliver the supply chain for a seven-fold increase in offshore wind, yeah? And you've seen commitments to gigawatts of offshore wind this year, and even just last week, European Union, 165 gigawatts. The IRA at least 30 gigawatts. Out in the Far East and the emerging countries, you're looking at 80 to 100 gigawatts. In the UK, we'd like to go from 10 gigawatts to 40 gigawatts. That's just gigawatts and gigawatts of offshore wind. And today's supply chain is really struggling. And today's manufacturers aren't making huge amounts of margin. Yeah? So we're going to need more supply chains, perhaps one in Europe and police two in the Far East and emerging markets. So we're going to have to address that if we really want to accelerate. The grid. I'll come back to the grid, and I always feel nervous talking about an electricity grid with, uh, when ESB understand that so well. And then turbine infrastructure and de-risking offshore projects. And we've heard a little bit about de-risking today. And I see it in two very different buckets, de-risking. One is, if we're going to have that scaling of offshore wind, yeah, you're going to need all the help we can get. And in DNV, because we've got an oil and gas industry and a shipping, we think there's some lessons learned here to speed up these offshore projects and de-risk them. But you're also going to have to look at that economic model to bring more of these online. Okay? And so that's in offshore wind, some of those challenges. In solar, there are also challenges. And I was wondering how to introduce the first two boxes. And you're going to smile because I think we had a speaker this morning that really eloquently showed you lots of nice graphics about why the ESG in the supply chain of solar panels and batteries is incredibly challenging. Yeah? The transparency is not there, and the sustainability is not there. And when you link it to the logistics of the countries that you're having to access the materials and components from Russia, Ukraine, Africa, this is not a straightforward process. And again, today, today's supply chain in solar is struggling to keep up with demand, and solar is going to have an even bigger increase than offshore wind. Yeah? So investment into the supply chains is going to be absolutely crucial to delivering this acceleration. And yes, the grid again, hooking all of this up, but I'll come back to that. And then finally, pricing mechanisms. One of the incredibly challenging things about doing renewables projects are the auctions. Yeah? And yes, we need a fair price, and we absolutely need to drive costs down 
and we need competition. But manufacturers will need to make some money. And if you actually go and look at the amount of money manufacturing is making in renewables, it's not massive margins. Yeah? So we're going to have to address how and not have a race to the bottom, because that then puts the pressure on the whole ESG and logistics buckets. Okay? So that's solar and that's offshore wind. If they're like the gate to the energy transition, then the power grid is the key. We can produce lots of lovely renewables electrons, but if we can't move them, we're going to have a lot, a lot of difficulty. And the grid is absolutely crucial to that, but it's going to go through a massive transition. Yeah? We're in a highly centralized grid at the moment. And you heard some of this morning speakers talk about it's centralized and we make supply over here and we move it through a divergent network to lots of consumers. But that highly centralized network is going to change. Yeah? Renewables is a highly, um, it can swing. Production can really swing by as much as 50%. Yeah? And if you're going to have swings in production of 50% of your electricity, you need a grid that is smart and flexible and that can cope with that. And you're going to need some investments to back that up. Most grids around the world are fairly aging infrastructure. Yeah? And there's a lot of resistance. And in our energy transition outlook, we'll need a doubling of worldwide grid capacity to bring all of that renewables on. And that's going to require investment. Investment in complexity and in renewing the aging equipment. But most importantly of all, we're going to have to carry the public again with us because every time you try to do anything onshore, that involves land planning and building, you'll get a lot of resistance. Policy. It's a real challenge, and in the UK, I, I see a lot of off-gem and bays, and just trying to balance the role of looking after the consumer with regulation and promoting innovation is not easy. And sometimes I think the tasks that sometimes government have to balance all of these things are really underestimated, and perhaps today, we really understand some of the steps that have been done. And it was interesting that Clegg did give a big shout out to the UK government for using CFD mechanisms for not just offshore wind, but also for hydrogen. Okay? So it's really important that policy is supporting those industries that need to take off. And then finally, collaboration. Absolutely no country can entirely electrify what it is doing without looking for resilience and support from its partners. So you will need collaboration, whether it's with the public or whether it's, your, it's with your neighbors, because that's the only way to truly build resilience. And then the key, key part, which I think um, came up this morning that uh, Dieter referred to, is how do you address storage? As you increase your renewables amount in your energy mix, so that volatility of supply is going to vary, and therefore the resilience becomes absolutely crucial. And storage will play an absolutely pivotal part. On my next slide, I have to say we are fully paid up members, DNV, of Claire's organization. Um, I'm not sure I've had a hydrogen t-shirt as long as Claire, uh, but in 2018, DNV built a row of houses together with National Grid, Cadent, and Scotia Gas Networks, and we now have a repurposed microgrid taking all pipelines and equipment that have been used, putting it at our spade atom test site, and studying how a hydrogen network from a repurposed grid will work and supply into some houses and homes. So there is no net zero without hydrogen. So absolutely, electrification is the main game for the energy transition, but it cannot address everything. And to some degree, my next slide is somewhat redundant, as Claire did a pretty good job on explaining it. But in terms of net zero, we need hydrogen both for those hard to abate sectors, but there's an also an element of balancing an energy system. Yeah? And that addressing intermittency. A gas molecule is easier to store. And therefore, you want an energy system. And I think there was a reference the minister made this morning to the UK government and how successful they have been. Yes, because the massive build out of 10 gigawatts of offshore wind was supported by gas. Now, clearly going forward, if we're going to build up that renewables picture and decrease natural gas, that we're going to have a, a need for something to balance. So both for the hard to abate sectors and for balancing the energy system, hydrogen really has an important, play to role, uh, important uh, role to play. And it's absolutely crucial to meeting net zero targets because we cannot electrify everything. 
It will be largely around manufacturing, as Claire referred to, but also there is heavy transport, certainly also involving shipping, and it will undoubtedly start off blue. Why? Because you will use all of your electrification coming from renewables to increase your electricity supply. Yeah? You don't want to make hydrogen initially. You'll have to look at blue hydrogen to create that blue economy and make, uh, to create that hydrogen economy and get it moving. And that's obviously taking um, gas and using CCS and steam reforming to make hydrogen. Okay. Over time, as you build out the renewables, yeah, so you can start to build out the green hydrogen story. And eventually, and in our forecast, we show by 2050, one third coming from pure renewables connected um, into hydrogen, uh, to create hydrogen, a third coming from the grid, and a third coming from natural gas and CCS. Okay. And then finally, the economics of hydrogen. Yeah. And both Claire and I are big fans of hydrogen, and we were chatting beforehand, but it has its limitations. Yeah? Hydrogen is not an energy vector you would choose by choice. Yeah? It's relatively expensive, and it's not massively efficient to use, but it's the only alternative we have for reaching net zero, and that's very, very important. But its cost means that largely you'll look at within countries and between countries, and not intercontinental, although shipping is likely to be based on ammonia. That's just a slide to give you an idea of the scale. Hydrogen's pretty tiny today. Even by 2030, only 0.5% of global energy demand. And by 2050, we're forecasting 5%. And you can see various different sectors on that. To meet net zero, you'll need three times this amount of hydrogen. So you really do need to create a hydrogen economy if we're going to make net zero. Right, just in terms of wrapping up, a transition is absolutely critical and no country can get left behind. And this is one of the challenges of the energy transition is a lot of focus on US, UK, Europe, and some places in the Far East, but you've got to take the whole world with you, otherwise we don't get a just transition as we discussed this morning. Yeah? Don't overlook the power grids. Yeah? And obviously, being at an event sponsored by ESB, I know you're not. Okay? And really, the power grid is crucial to moving those renewables electrons through the system. Policy needs to keep up, and it's not easy juggling all the parameters that government and regulators have to balance. And then finally, it's also about whole system, and we will need new energy vectors to get us to net zero. And just finally wrapping up, remember, that path that we're currently showing you with all that great renewables and hydrogen takes you to 2.3 degrees. That's still way off 1.5 degrees. Yeah? For 1.5 degrees, it is technically feasible, but it will absolutely require even more political will than we currently have for a massive build-out of renewables that we can already see, electrification and hydrogen. We need even more than that to be able to deliver net zero. Okay? And some regions and some countries will have to go early. So some countries will need to be net zero 2040, 2045, because there will be some that will be 2060. Yeah? So it's not about everyone going to 2050, because that's not fair. Yes, we need renewables, electrification. Yes, we need hydrogen, bioenergy. But we will also need for net zero CCS and direct air capture, which you've heard a little bit about today. Okay? But above all, your Accelerate banner is completely correct. We need massive action to do even more than we're currently doing in the energy transition. And we're struggling to meet the current ambitions that most governments have set. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, timing-wise, our next outlook is actually coming on Thursday. So I've had to use last year's results because it's heavily embargoed when you work for a large company. They won't allow you to give even a sneak results to you guys today. Um, so our next transition is being published on Thursday. Um, and then we're doing a UK-only one for the first time in December, and you'll find all the material at our dmv.com site. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hi, thanks very much. Paul, I just, recently, um, Finance Minister Pascal Donoghue was talking about, in light of the re recent revised CSO statistics, that um, we're going to need billions just to run to stand still because population increases are going to be ahead of time. And just listen to what Harry is talking about, how some countries and some regions are going to go earlier. How are we going to manage that increased demand, um, or just the increased demand going forward, but even just in 
particularly this area with population demand, how are we going to meet the targets by 2025 or even further down the line if we're already struggling mid-term? Yeah, look, it's, it's incredibly challenging, isn't it? You know, but there's, it's important to distinguish between what's an investment and what's a cost. Mm -hmm. Investment is something that permeates throughout society and we all benefit from it, and it's something that we need to do. We often forget, actually, that when it comes to climate action, that there's a cost to doing nothing as well. It costs a lot of money just to run the system at the current yes. level of emissions. It costs about just under 10% of our GDP, so it's absolutely massive. So you, you often hear these arguments that, well, it's too costly for climate action because it's going to cost billions, but actually doing nothing costs billions as well. And to give it a sense of context, the analysis that we've done in UCC to understand the investment that we need to make, and again, that investment has a benefit to broader society. It's not just about bringing electrons into people's houses, it's about well-being, it's about health, it's about broader societal issues. The extra additional investment that Ireland needs to make is about 2% of GDP. In the UK, it's probably around one and a half to, 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 to 1% of GDP, but Ireland is the late starter. So the additional investment that we make, that we need to do in Ireland, to, have, to meet our net zero targets, to move completely away from fossil fuels, to have a healthier society, to have you know, lots of benefits in society, that additional investment is 2% of all the GDP, all the money that flows through our economy. You know, when you think back, you know, we're in a wonderful historic building here at the moment. Decisions were made in here back in the early 20s, maybe 30s, about Ordna Crusha, to build Ordna. And, we and we've heard this many times in, in the media recently. At its time, the investment in Ordna Crusha represented 25% of all the money that, flew, that, that went through the Irish economy at its time. So, yes, we have to invest. Uh, it's a significant amount of money but it's not an unmanageable amount of money. And if that investment is made in smart places, serving people, serving communities, and serving families, that's a really, really good, enduring investment that we'll all benefit from. And just from. picking up on Brenda's point, Paul, from earlier on, do you think that there is a way to ring fence, uh, to create green tariffs for the, those who are most vulnerable, for those who are most hit by fuel poverty, or is that to, to is, 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 that, is, is that in fact, uh, you know, change in the market? I think a lot of that stuff is happening already within the market in Ireland. We have a new res auction scheme in Ireland, for example, that's returning about 300 million back to the market this year. So for the first time ever, actually, in Ireland, the public service obligation will be negative. We're all getting 100 euros or so, maybe 140 euros back into our bill. Uh, I hear a lot on the media at the moment around windfall tax and windfall profits, but the political expectation, I think, is larger than the evidence is there to support it. When you look at the numbers that supply companies have published in the public domain, we're not talking about excessive profits. Many of the companies have posted profits that have been lower than last year. So I think the, ex the, the political expectation is, 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 not at, is not matched by the evidence there to support it. And we need to be careful about that because if we're telling the public, look, there's billions and mi out there that we're not getting, that's not actually true. There's no doubt, I think, that smaller suppliers, particularly on the generation side only, particularly maybe renewable suppliers, will be earning excess profits this year, but on the wider evidence, we need to manage that expectation when delivering to the public, because from what we've seen already, it's just the, the numbers aren't there to support that narrative. Claire, what about managing my expectations? Harry said hydrogen wouldn't be the first source of choice, but that we need it going forward. Considering you're way ahead in the hydrogen journey than we are, um, how do you manage public expectations or the narrative around hydrogen? And does it work in all sectors, or as you say, it's a, sort of the infrastructure is a little bit complicated and needs investment there as well. Um, so, I mean, Harry's absolutely right. Hydrogen is not going to be the biggest energy vector. Um, electrification is still our primary um, decarbonisation pathway that we have open to us. But um, the reality is you need a mixed approach. And um, there's parts of the energy system where electrification will play the vast majority, if not all, of the role. Um, there'll be other parts where hydrogen will play a significant role and a much bigger role than electrification. Um, the challenge sometimes is, is in those areas where um, there will be a, a sort of mixture of different technologies, um, and how do you then communicate that with the, the public? Um, and I, I think, as I said, I think it's really important that we are starting that conversation early, because these are technologies that are going to be in people's homes, they're going to be driving, they're going to be sitting on them, they're going to be seeing them, um, and bringing people along on that journey is, is hugely important. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the things that's actually just really struck me today um, is, you know, in the, in, within the sector, we tend to li be a little bit nerdy. Um, we're very good at talking about technology, which doesn't always necessarily translate to the way that we talk to people about it. Um, and even just seeing the, 
the way that the arts have been integrated um, into this conference today. It's a different way of communicating with people. Very and I think we have to be creative um, around the ways that we're having these sorts of conversations, and particularly around who's also owning those conversations with the public. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting one around how we communicate and how we talk about um, Haitian and all of these various different technologies. Unfortunately, Varun couldn't join us for the Q&A, and I suppose, Harry, if I asked you, out of context, what do you think of the IRA, it would be strange. But given that the act that Varun was talking about was a lot about um, enabling technologies. So on the demand side, what are you seeing that could be breakthrough technologies that are going to help that side? Because I know obviously you spoke a lot on the supply side, but what are you seeing in that area that is really going to help accelerate that change? Actually, demand, demand side is really hard. There's been a lot more focus on supply side because in some ways it's easier to, to, you, to get your system boundaries there and move. On the demand side, I think we're actually lagging, even in the okay. UK, in, in, in the use of innovation, in the use of models to change. The demand side, you've got businesses and you've got consumers, yeah? And uh, we've just been discussing, you know, the worst case scenario that National Grid put out last week mm -hmm. involves some sort of rolling blackout. Well, that... That's not the certainty that businesses and consumers want. So you've got to be looking at mechanisms in which you can spread demand. And I think the European Union has come out with some of its suggestions, where, which asking all of its member states to look at efficiency, to look at can you move your demand for different periods during the day, and looking at resilience. But the consumer will have to play a bigger role on demand side management. And that's tough. From what I've seen in the UK, moving the consumer expectations and sentiment is really, really tough. Do you think there's a, a kind of a strange juxtaposition because everyone is so aware of climate now? Is it just kind of make us chase, but not just yet? Or is it just because it's not I mean, real I, in people's lives? It again, has to be. The success of the last you know, two decades in the UK, backing out coal, using renewables to 10 gigawatts, using gas, was almost painless for the consumer. They, they almost didn't notice what was going on because as far as they're concerned, the electricity still arrived. The next transition with the electrification of demand, EVs, heat pumps, the change in the variability of supply as well, which is you know, a uh, real challenge for resilience, requires us to take the consumer. In an, and from what I've seen working with grid companies in the UK, we're not doing a good enough job, and someone said it this morning, of the narrative. I think we're good in energy at talking to each other and explaining why we need to do the energy transition. I don't think we've done a very good job of speaking to Joe Public. Absolutely, just the public narratives. Well, this uh, conversation is certainly helping. Um, I'm going to just to thank all of our speakers, Paul, Claire, Harry, and of course, Varun, earlier. Um, you're going to your last coffee break. If you can, be back here in 10 minutes for the rest of our session. Thanks a million.